Thank you, uh, Sterling, very much, and good morning. It, it, it's uh, really a, an honor to be up here today at this august gathering in uh, our, the second um, America First Energy Conference, uh, which, which came out of the election of uh, President Trump and, uh, and his, his America First Energy Plan. Before I get into these slides, I want to give you uh, some pretty stark numbers for, for coal consumption in the United States. Uh, as you heard, I was with Peabody for uh, 14 years in St. Louis, uh, the, the uh, world's largest shareholder-owned coal company. Before that, for 20 years, I spent with rural electric cooperatives running a coal co-op uh, uh, with power plants spread in, uh, around the middle of the country in nine different states, 11 different power plants. So I've been in coal since 1980. It's been my life. I'm committed to it. I'm also a fossil fuels guy uh, and uh, engaged very heavily in the climate debate in the 90s on behalf of these uh, rural electric coal plants. Uh, coal, though, is, is, uh, on, is at, a, at a bottom right now. I think it's a bottom in the United States if things go right from here. But let me give you some really stark figures. So the U.S. coal production and consumption peak uh, for electricity use in the United States was a billion tons. And that level uh, maintained from 2005 through 2008. In 2017, U.S. coal electricity consumption was only 665 million tons of coal per year. Uh, this year, it's estimated to decline further, uh, not a dramatic drop, but a drop nonetheless, a, a material one of 3 to 4 percent, down to 635 to 640 million tons of coal a year. And that represents a 350 plus million ton per year drop from the peak uh, in, in 2008. Intervening between then and now was a financial crisis. That was certainly a factor. The shale gas re uh, revolution was certainly a factor. But the most important factor was the presidency of, of Barack Obama and the, and the complicity of the United States Congress in showering renewable uh, electricity resources with tax credits and, and uh, funding uh, to build this industry out. Consequently, coal share of generation, electricity generation in 2009 was 44%. Uh, in 2017, it was 30%. Uh, EIA, the Energy Information Agency in our Department of Energy, estimates that in 2018 we'll be, uh, we'll be at 29 percent. The, the, I, I follow a, a place called uh, uh, CelsiusEnergy.net every day, and they've got real-time live graph on there uh, showing the electricity consumption by sector. I say it's going to be 25, 26 percent this year. It's, it's really incredible what's going on right now, the power burn in the natural gas space. Gas's share has gone from 24% in, in uh, uh, 2009 to 31% last year. Uh, EIA says 34% this year. It could be even higher. Wind and solar has gone from 1.8% to 7.7%. So coal is really taking it on the chin. U.S. electricity generation coal has taken it on the chin. Exports are in pretty good shape. Uh, and, and exports are an important part of why the, the coal industry uh, is improving financially right now. And I do expect that to continue. We're uh, roughly at 100 million tons per year of exports this year. Uh, the peak was, was higher than that in, in uh, I think, 2013, if, if I'm not right. Uh, I think that's right. But was 130, maybe 140 million tons. But I think we're going back to that. I think coal exports will be a... A, a positive story going forward for coal. We've got to get the left coast figured out on that, though, because California and the state of Washington, which has fabulous waters for uh, western coal exports, are hostile. And um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Democratic administration in Washington is, is prohibiting any, any ports going in for coal exports, which is a flat violation of our Commerce Clause, but that's another subject. But coal exports are in good shape. But I want to talk to you today briefly then about the, uh, where we stand, what's happened, uh, why I do have some optimism, but, but also the importance of this. This is the America First Energy Plan that, that President Trump put on the table as a candidate in Bismarck, North Dakota, in a speech in, in uh, May of, of 2016. 
uh, coal, of course, is included in that, what he called clean coal, and, and uh, we are moving forward uh, with respect to that, for sure. Uh, and uh, in the oil and gas space, and you read about that every day, and our panel will talk more about that. The election results were hugely important for our country, for all of us. It's a, a major positive that uh, President Trump is in office. <clears throat> and, and I think that he will succeed. I think he will succeed in this term. I think he will be reelected. <clears throat> we have a midterm coming up very close, uh, very soon. Uh, the midterm, if, if, the, if it goes Republican, we could get into a, a situation where we have a veto-proof uh, Senate. Um, I'm sorry, a filibuster-proof Senate, I should say. Uh, but that remains to be seen, and I'm not really here today to talk about politics. But I do want to talk about policy with some backdrop for it. CO2, EPA, Paris, huge issues for coal. Um, and I'll, at, at the end, I'll talk more about CO2. Obviously, we pulled out of Paris. But I want to give the uh, backdrop for the policy discussion on why this is so important to all of us. Electrification is the primary technological achievement of the 20th century per the National Society of Engineering. Uh, John Glenn, our man on the moon, was president of it when they, uh, when they announced that. Our man on the moon vision is electrification for the United States. And electricity as a percent of total U.S. energy consumption is going to go up. For sure it's going to go up. It's, it's ecowatts, what Mark Mills calls ecowatts. It's, ben it's beneficial electrification. Electricity at the point of use is the cleanest, most efficient form of energy. Uh, the world is, uh, thrives on electricity every day. The United States has succeeded because of electricity and coal, not in spite of it. Electricity sales in the United States should increase <clears throat> as the economy continues to improve, which it will, tariff wars notwithstanding, which, <clears throat> excuse me, which will get subsumed uh, in the massive economy that's the U.S. The press says we're going to lose, lose these trade wars. Are you kidding? We are by far the biggest market in the world for all of the people that have been hosing us at their end of the table. Uh, and the President of the United States is going to take care of that. I believe that. Um, I'm not a trade expert. I'm a free market person. Uh, but to me, this is the ultimate art of the deal we've got going on in, in real sight right in front of us, and I trust Donald Trump. Uh, coal's competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis natural gas uh, prices, I think, the, the, this is somewhat dated, but I think we'll be there going forward. I think what's going on right now in the natural gas space with the, with the massive turn to power burn because of coal plant retirements, with the massive new LNG exports, uh, with the inability to get associated gas from the Permian to Henry Hub because, because of the uh, lack of pipeline capacity and the focus on oil drilling, all of these things come together or have put us right now in a rising natural gas price structure. We need coal. And we need baseload coal to continue success as a, as our, a society. But the uh, coal's prospects right now, as I stand here in front of you today, will continue to decline per EIA. And, and that is happening this year. This year is probably the peak of coal plant retirements. There are some scheduled in out years from here. Uh, but the, the, and, and maybe those happen, maybe they don't. People are resisting those at the state level. <clears throat> and there needs to be more of that, it needs to be more focused, needs to be more organized uh, than is now the case. But in any event, it's really not the next couple of years, it's the future. Because a number of the regulated utilities around the country, uh, no reason to name names, but there are a dozen of them, have announced that they are going to administer, they own coal plants and they're going to administer their, fair, their affairs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 from their generating fleet which was the Barack Obama plan and the Hillary Clinton plan, so it's as if Donald Trump was not elected president of the United States so far as they are concerned. That's what needs to be stopped. Why? Because we are on the road to high prices and scarcity in the electricity space if we go down the path of taking out coal, putting in natural gas and renewables, and that's it. It's going to be a bad day for the United States, and that needs to be stopped. One of, the, one of the things, talking from here in terms of what's actually going on on the ground, there are no new U.S. coal plants going in right now. EIA says there won't be, uh, period. 
Uh, they say until 2040, the, for, for where I sit, that's forever. This is the U.S. coal fleet uh, is shrinking, as I just said, and, and these figures are publicly available. If you just go in and look, put in U.S. coal, coal plant retirements, you'll get a, a, a whole rash of stories. This is a big part of this issue, and that's the natural degradation of these plants as they sit if they are not retrofitted as you go forward. It's like buying a car. You have to, you have to reinvest in the car to keep the car going. If you don't reinvest in these coal plants, um, they, they will, their capacity degrades, and that's the degradation profile. There's a better, a better slide describing that. So it goes from where we are today, these plants are very old, the weighted average uh, age of the plants today is 45 years. By 2040, it will be seven, 70 years. It basically goes to zero. You have to retrofit them as you go. May we at, may retrofit them under current market environment and under EPA regulations? That is another question in its entirety. Uh, we have in place now a regime where coal is going to collapse unless there is a major change in the policy outlook for them. This is a narrative of what I just said. The only way constant electricity production from the aging fleet can be maintained is through massive capital investments in retrofits, operation and maintenance, and new technologies. Period. Full stop. May we do that? Obviously, we need uh, to keep these lights on. What a fabulous country. And this is a fabulous part of the country down here in Louisiana. I'm really happy to be down here. But you see the, the population distribution from that. But what, what we need, and this is really the meat of what I have here to say today, is, is essentially a major change in policy towards coal-fired electricity generation in the United States of America, what I call policy parity. The first change in policy parity is on carbon dioxide emissions from the point of electricity generation. Natural gas has an advantage, natural gas producers logically have touted that advantage and go after coal based on, based on CO2 emissions. Aubrey McClendon, be, before he tragically uh, passed away, had a cottage industry that he created anti-coal so he could get higher prices for natural gas for unwise investments that Chesapeake made in, in borrowing tens of billions of dollars to go in the natural gas business. But at EPA, what we need are the following. First of all, endangerment has to go. Endangerment has to go. The Clean Power Plan, uh, under new administrator, acting administrator Wheeler has said that they, they will look at the Clean Power Plan, how they will repeal that, or will they repeal it or replace it in 2019. Half of the narrative in the Clean Power Plan is based on endangerment principles. It's not different reading, it was 2015, than the endangerment finding that was put in place in 2019. I'm a lawyer, I've read it. The apocalypse is upon us unless we stop use, putting CO2 in the air and we're going to start with coal. That's in the Clean Power Plan. So by, by repealing the Clean Power Plan or changing it, they must, they must address the science, I believe. And in doing so, they must address endangerment, I believe. <clears throat> New source review, best available control technology or other regulations <clears throat> excuse me, other regulations at EPA that need to be changed to take CO2 off the table as currency in setting energy policy in the United States, full stop. Do away with it. And if we don't, coal's future is not good. If we do, coal's future is very, very bright. Finally, national security is a major issue in the operation of baseload coal today that's being, that is being retired, that and nuclear units. National security is a very broad issue. It could mean manufacturing, it's hospitals, it's your lights are on, it's this, it's that. It's also national defense because the, there are major military installations all around the United States. I grew up in Phoenix and I went to school in Tucson, Arizona. And I am old enough to have been a freshman there during the Cuban Missile Crisis and it's the home of the Davis Month and Air Force Base, and there were Titan missiles in silos all around that base. Today it's a Strategic Air Command nuclear center. Davis Month and Air Force Base for our national defense needs electricity. It needs electricity. The grid has to operate. Nobody understands that better than President Trump. Nobody understands that better than the Department of Energy. It is now in front of the National Security Council, I am advised, as to an order under the Defense Production Act and the Federal Power Act 
to require electric uh, generation transmission companies, whether they're the, I, the independent system operators or other entities, to purchase from these coal plants and nuclear plants to keep them running. In effect, a moratorium on any further coal plants for a two-year period. Uh, the President directed the Secretary of Energy, Perry, to come up with a plan uh, in, in uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in June of this year, and, and uh, June 1 of this year, I believe, and that matter is under advisement right now. Here's what I say. I say no more retirements, period, from here for this two-year window. A moratorium on coal plant retirements for all the reasons that I've stated, but also for, for national security. Finally, uh, coal absolutely has to engage not only in Washington, D.C., uh, but, but on a on a state-by-state -state basis and telling this story, and coal is not doing that. Coal, in some sense, uh, the, the people that represent coal in Washington, D.C., um, are good people, they're smart people, they're well-meaning people, but there's a, not a, a sense of alacrity there in terms of how serious this crisis is and at the state level. So uh, will coal survive in the future? It will. Do we need it? It will, but we have to work at it. Thank you very much.